Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and in his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are a curse from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mehuahel, and Mehuahel fathered Methuselah, and Methuselah fathered Lamech, and Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of other Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who played the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I have to say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh, at the time that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Thank you. All right. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel. So I want to start by asking a question that I think will prompt us into really the main point of this text, or one of the main points. How do we comfort ourselves when we sin? That's the question, the main question I want us to answer today. How do we comfort ourselves when we sin? Now, most of you are walking with Jesus. You know the gospel. Um, I know several of you, and I have confidence that, that many of you are preaching the gospel to yourself when you sin. That's one of your main responses. You know to run towards God when you sin and not away from Him. Uh, but I'm asking, how do we comfort ourselves when we're, when we're not on our game? Okay, so when, we're, when part of the sin we're committing is that hard-heartedness that keeps us from repenting. How does our flesh typically comfort itself when we sin? That's the question. And I think one of the most common ways that, that actually everyone in the world, whether you're a Christian or not, comforts ourselves when, when we sin is, is we minimize the sin. Now, there's other ways to, to deal with it that, that are not holy either, but I want to I focus on this one. We tend to minimize our sin. We think things like this to ourselves. Everyone does it, and not only does everyone do it, um, but I probably do it less <laughs> than most. It's not really having that big of an impact on anyone 
I'm getting better, and one slip-up shouldn't really negate the progress I'm seeing. And then this last one is actually tricky. We think to ourselves, God looks past my sin and loves me just as I am. The reason that's tricky is because the words are technically true, but the tone reveals a sinful motivation of taking God's grace in vain. So we minimize our sin. Now, I assume that most of the time we don't uh, stop and consciously say things like I've just said in full sentences. I'm talking about that we're good at this. They're, not, they're just reflexes in our emotions. We rapid fire these kinds of explanations to our soul like pushing the button for more morphine. Our conscience tries to wake up and say that, that really was and then click, more morphine, click, more morphine. We put our conscience back to sleep by minimizing it. Some of us do this more, some do it a lot, but I submit to you that all of us do it more than we realize. And so if that's true, what should we do? And that's where I really think Genesis 4 can help us. This famous story tells us so much. It's one of the most important stories in the Bible for understanding the nature of sin. Uh, But one of the main things, and this is my main point this morning for us, is that sin and its consequences are constant in this life and extremely dark. But God's redemption is brighter than every darkness and final. Okay, so sin and its consequences are constant in this life and extremely dark, but God's redemption is brighter than every darkness and it's final. So sin is great, but God's love is greater. You guys know this, but this story is is so helpful for us. First, sin is great. So sin is constant. Sin and its consequences are constant in this life. So I want us to remember where we are in the story. I I know you guys are just a few Sundays into Genesis, um, but God created a magnificent and breathtaking world, right? And the first thing that humans did is sin and ruin everything. Satan tempted and deceived, and Adam and Eve took the bait. Then, as we know, God cursed the serpent to be shamed and hated. He cursed the woman in childbearing and romance, and he cursed the man in all his work. But God also promised redemption. In the same chapter that humanity fell into sin, God promised that the woman's offspring shall triumph over the offspring of the serpent. That's where we are. So when we pick up chapter 4, verse 1, we see that Eve gets pregnant. Okay, so she's pregnant with Cain, the first human to come out of a womb. And she says it was with the help of the Lord. The commentators pretty much agree that this is most likely Eve remembering the promise that God gave in chapter 3 of the woman's offspring triumphing over the serpent's offspring. She is understandably assuming that Cain is that promised offspring through whose line the offspring of the serpent will be crushed. So notice that she gives glory to God right after Cain, but Abel comes in the very next sentence. So this is interesting to me because if Cain was the, the, the offspring foretold, the opening of chapter four could really be the beginning of like a happily ever after. Like, yeah, there's this annoying serpent with annoying offspring that just provide just enough setbacks to make the story really interesting. But basically the rest of the story is super happy all the time. That's how it could have gone. You guys know that that's not how it goes. The first few chapters, if the first few chapters of Genesis were a play, the very first scene the very first act after the scene changed from the Garden of Eden to exile is mostly about sin. Okay, so this, this entire chapter, chapter 4, is almost all about sin. Don't worry, there is good news. Michael wouldn't have let me come up here if there wasn't good news. Okay, but we're going to focus on that. So we see sin called out starting in verse 5, but actually from verse 5, we see that the first sinful act is actually in verse 4. Okay, so... And then we'll basically sin, see sin almost all the way through verse 24, okay? I was going to try to fly through this first point, uh, but as I prepared, I realized I have some rabbit holes I want to go down. So, fair warning, I'm going to go down a couple of rabbit holes. Um, so, quickly or not, here we go. So, first, Cain's offering was given with some level of sin in his heart, okay? Now, at one level, everything we do is a mixture of sin and faith. And in that sense, Abel had some level of sin in his heart too, okay? But God accepted Abel's offering, and he rejected Cain's. We could just explain this briefly, but I really think it's worth ensuring that we get a really good understanding of this point, because I think it can be confusing. 
So here's the first rabbit hole, if you will. Uh, most of the time, this story of the two offerings is explained by observing that Cain's offering was not of his first fruits, whereas Abel brings the firstborn of his flock. And therefore, that Cain's offering, offering was inherently less pleasing to God, just because of what it was. And I, I'm okay with that understanding, and it's likely that the Israelites that first heard this would have picked up on that and would have understood that. But I think they also would have understood something else. And I really think there's a danger here to, to under-spiritualize this, believe it or not. We can make too much of the outward action of Cain's sacrifice and not enough about what was going on in Cain's heart. Here's what I mean. Hebrews 11.4 tells us this, and I, some of these are not on the slides, guys. It's my fault. I didn't put all this on the slides. I'm sorry. Hebrews 11.4 says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he, Abel, was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. So this, this unlocks this, this little part for us. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God. So Cain's offering was not by faith. And in the same paragraph in Hebrews 6, the same place we just read that from, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So Cain's sacrifice did not please God because it was not by faith. Okay, so was it not pleasing God because it wasn't Cain's first fruits like it was for Abel? Probably, but if that's the case, why didn't Cain just give his first fruits like Abel? We still have to go deeper. And I'm arguing that it was because he wasn't coming with faith to begin with. His insufficient offering just reflected that he wasn't loving God. I wanted to explain this primarily so that we don't come away thinking that what we really need to do is to get all our outward stuff straight. We need to get all our material service to God exactly right, or he won't be pleased with us. And we have that temptation, y'all, whether we admit it or recognize it consciously all the time. I submit to you that Cain could have brought the tiniest, wimpiest little grape off the vine if it was the first one, and if he had brought it in faith to God, it would have been accepted and pleasing. Does that make sense? Okay, so first rabbit hole. Back to the main point. Sin and its consequences are constant in this life. After Cain's offering is rejected, what's the next sin that we see in the passage? Y'all, I almost asked for a show of hands, but I didn't want it to be too tricky because it's tempting to say it's the murder. But it's actually not the murder of Abel yet. Cain's anger in verse 5 is actually the second, call it outward sin, that we see here. It says, Cain was very angry, and his face fell. That's sin, but why? Why do we know that's sin? It's because when God makes our sin clear to us, the only righteous response is repentance towards God. Is all anger sin? No. We know that from other places in the Bible. Um, we're going to come back to, to that in a bit. But... What I'm saying here is that we know Cain's anger was sinful, okay, because it's in direct response to God. All right. Now, the next sin is the murder, okay, of Abel. And believe it or not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this one for now because we're going to come back to it at a later point, okay? But it speaks for itself. It's murder, okay? So the third sin we see in the passage, if we take it from um, Cain luring his, his brother out to the field and, you know, tricking him and then killing him, all that act right there is, is the third sin, Okay, next, God confronts Cain again in verse 9. He asks where Abel is, and what does Cain do this time? He does what we all tem tend to do. He minimizes. First, he lies, says, I don't know, and he minimizes. He says, am I my brother's keeper? So again, he fails to repent when God directly confronts him with his sin. He lies, he doesn't take responsibility, and he doesn't acknowledge how wicked his, his action is. Okay, I know I'm flying through this. We're going to go back and, and hit a few of these in more uh, detail. But next, maybe not quite as apparent, but it's another sinful response to God. Picking up in verse 10, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me away today, away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. 
I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Okay, so notice that while Adam's curse in Genesis 3 was that all his work would become difficult, including the work of the ground, which was Cain's profession, now because of Cain's sin, it gets worse for him. Okay, so while we can relate to Cain's frustration, we have to see the sin in his response. Again, he was given a chance to repent. But what does he do? He just complains about his punishment. So I I would ask, how often do we confuse repentance or the worldly remorse? In other words, how often do we feel shame or fear or fresh resolve just because we were caught? (laughs) Or because the consequences are bad or because of some other circumstantial shift Just like in the parable of the prodigal son, here in Genesis 4, the father has the last word for the older brother, and it's a word of mercy. Look at verse 15. God tells Cain he'll protect him, and he puts a protective mark on him. There's a lot of debate on what that mark is, and I actually decided not to take time to go through all the different possibilities. There's just, there's no telling. There's probably some here who could, who could help you more with that than others, more than me for sure. Then, again, similar to the older brother and the prodigal son, the story breaks here before we see any repentance. If anything, the text hints that Cain doesn't ever repent. Verse 16 says, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So away from the presence of the Lord. And even more clear, guys, in 1 John 3.12, it literally says Cain was of the evil one. So Eve's first offspring that she thought could be the family line promised to crush the serpent's head ends up being the serpent's, serpent's offspring or the first in that line. I realize there's some metaphor there, but that's, that's what the text is trying to tell us. Okay, here we go. Let's keep going. Next, Cain gets married, and his offspring are listed out for uh, six generations away from Adam and Eve. His offspring are credited with being culture makers, okay, filling the creation mandate. So Cain builds a city, and one of his sons uh, keeps livestock. One, you know, is a musical culture maker. One makes things out of metal, okay, to be used for all different purposes. Um, And then we get to Lamech, the last one listed in Cain's line. What is he like? (laughs) In verses 23 and 24, we see that not only has Lamech killed someone without just cause, the text is really wanting us to see that, but he brags about it. One commentator noticed that while Cain's descendants are credited for being great culture makers, and none of them, except for Lamech, actually has sin listed, it's not until Seth's line in the last two verses of this chapter that we see any sign of faith. Okay, so again, given Cain's attitude, the fact that his tribe or his line moved away from the presence of the Lord, and faith is not mentioned anywhere in that line, and then lastly, Lamech is portrayed as at least as bad as Cain, if not worse. The bulk of this chapter is God saying, look how pervasive this is. He's saying, look at how far-reaching and constant your sin is and the consequences that it brings. It's worse than we realize, okay? That's the first point. Sin and its consequences are constant. Okay, second main point. If there's a slide for this, it's the second main point. (laughs) I think there is. Sin is extremely dark. So we kind of glanced over Cain's murder of Abel, and I said we'd come back to it. Um, We just mentioned Lamech's murder of someone who just hurt him very briefly, but I want to go back and think about the murder of Cain and Abel. First act after being exiled from the garden. Scene one, murder. Scene two with Lamech, murder. Sometimes people say, why did God make some arbitrary law about the fruit? What's up with the fruit? Genesis 3, right? Right? And what do we say? The same thing God says to us throughout the Bible. It wasn't really about the fruit. It was about the heart, right? And that's true. But how many times do we respond even to that thought if we're honest and just think, yeah, yeah, I know. I've heard that a million times. It's just about the heart. Well, I really think that's one of the reasons God says, okay. That's why we're going straight to chapter 4 in Genesis. You still think the fruit doesn't reveal much darkness in your heart. And now we're here and we have murder after murder. All right, so Cain and Abel. We've already seen how Cain had sinful anger in his heart before he killed Abel. It's just like Jesus mentioned several thousand years later in Matthew 5. He says, 
Jesus said in Matthew 5 that being angry with your brother brings the same judgment as murder. Why? Because they both flow from the same sinful heart, and we see that on display here. Anger actually leads to a literal murder. But that's what's inside us, y'all. But there's more going on here. Genesis 4, chapter 6, right after Cain gets angry, the Lord says to Cain, this is verse 6, Why are you, are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. All right, here's for our second point. I really want us to sit in these couple of verses right here. Um, This is maybe the second rabbit hole, uh, but it also could be like the third and fourth. Okay, so just bear with me. My first thought when I read this part is to ask, is God just telling Cain to buckle down, do better, get your act together? In other words, is God giving Cain only the law and not the gospel here? And I think maybe that's possible. We have to remember that we don't even deserve to hear the gospel, guys, much less be saved by it. Even if others hear the gospel, that doesn't entitle us to hear it. How could we say in the same breath that we deserve eternal punishment, but we still deserve to to hear the glorious good news? That's not how it works. That doesn't work. So anyone who hears the gospel, all of us who have heard the gospel, have already experienced an amazing privilege. But having said all that, I don't actually think that's what God is doing here. I don't think he's giving Cain just the law and condemnation. Let me read another passage. There's not a slide for this one either, um, but I think it's going to help us. Romans 2, 6 through 7 says this, God will render to each one according to his works, according to his faith. Well, hold on, according to his works. To those by patience in well-doing, so there's the link, Seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey righteousness, uh, unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Okay, so God can say, according to his works and in well-doing, because he's speaking of works that evidence faith. I think most of you know this. But this becomes abundantly clear in the New Testament, but it's actually present in the Old Testament very clearly as well. I think that's what God's doing to Cain here. I think he's saying, Cain, if your good works prove your faith, you will be accepted. If you do well, that's what he says. I won't spend much more time on this one, but one clue we get is that after Cain complains about his punishment, again, God doesn't condemn him. He shows him mercy. He reassures him that he'll protect him. He puts the mark on him, tells him that no one will kill Cain. This is similar to how God clothed Adam and Eve, if you guys remember. After he he made the curses on the serpent and the woman and the man. What did God do? Did he just leave them and condemn them? No, he he clothed them with skins. Okay, so I think there's something similar going on here with Cain. One of the points there, guys, is God's mercy has no trouble (laughs) coming behind our greatest sins. Has no trouble coming behind our greatest sins. Okay, second thought, the one I really, really want to spend more time on is this. What does God mean in verse 7? When he says, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. What's going on there? If you have a slightly older translation, yours might say, instead of its desire is contrary to you, it might say something like, it desires to have you. Okay? That might be in some of your translations if you have an older one or you've read that before. I would like that that slightly older translation a lot. The sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, to eat you alive. Some say the word crouch here gives us a sense of a predator hunting prey. So like a big wild cat, you know, like a a cougar or something, crouching in the brush and springing in surprise to actually kill kill, um, and eat. A slightly more literal sense of this word crouch gives the sense that there's actually something kind of crouching in rest or in repose but maybe right outside your door or along a path that you're walking. And if threatened, even just something walking by it, it will spring in defense. And the text says it's crouching at the door, right? Okay, so I think the second approach, uh, the second sense of that word is valid. But I also really like the, f- the first sense. It's a predator hunting prey because the text also says it desires to have you. Okay, so can you guys think of 
an animal we may have recently seen in the Bible that lies in repose outside a door or along a path, but also that can have you, (laughs) that can kill you with one hit. How about a serpent? So this is really, really interesting. Why would God personify sin like this? Why would he describe it as something outside of you that's, that's animated, that actually has a will? This is one of the first descriptions, uh, deep descriptions of sin in the Bible. There's probably multiple things that could be said here, so I'm just going to pick up on the one that sticks out to me the most. When I put together the image of a predator waiting outside my door, ready to strike, wanting to have me, something that's alive, I think of appetite, okay, appetite. This thing is hungry. And what does it eat? It eats me. It eats us. But even though it's personified as something outside of me for the sake of the metaphor and the imagery, it's actually inside me. So what does it eat? It eats me. What does that mean? It's feeding on me, but it's part of me. This thing called sin, it's feeding on me and feeding on itself. Okay? Just like anything else, it grows as it's fed. So what does that look like? Anyone here who has studied addiction knows that this is actually how addictions work. Okay? I've, studied a little bit of st- I've done a little bit of study on addictions, um, so I'm just going to speak to this part uh, mostly. When you feed an addiction, what happens? When you actually participate in it more and more, it just gets worse, right? It feeds on itself. Okay, so there's a cycle of feeding and growing that it gets exponentially worse. Even if you haven't studied addictions, but you've been in one or you're in one now, you know this. What happens over time in an addiction? It doesn't just keep going. You need more and more to satisfy the craving, right? Every alcoholic says this and knows this. First, it was one drink, and it, it was fine, but then not too much longer, and you, need, you want two, because if one's good, two's probably better. But if two is good, then three is probably better, and so on and on. But then, it's not just would it be more fun or would it be better. Somewhere along the line, it changes, right? Instead of thinking, wouldn't three be better than two, alcoholics start to need it. They think to themselves, man, I've only got two drinks in the fridge. I have to go buy more or I won't make it tonight. The same thing goes when you're looking at things online that you shouldn't be. Over time, even if it's slow, like over years, it becomes less and less satisfying. So what do we do? You search for more extreme stuff. You try to up the intake to satisfy the bigger craving. And when it gets really bad, you start to act out in real life because that's the only way you can satisfy the urge. So I'm illustrating all of these to drive home. What's going on here in this, in this little spot in Genesis 4? Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. It wants to swallow us up. One of the dangers in talking about addiction is that several of you would probably say that you've never actually had an addiction, maybe besides coffee or something, which isn't sinful. At least, uh, it better not be. (laughs) But I want to draw this out a little more. There's a story in Exodus 16 where the Israelites are grumbling that God has taken them out into the wilderness to kill them. It's been such a bad experience that they just feel like they're at their wit's end. So they grumble and complain to God. In Exodus 16, 3, the people of Israel literally say this to God. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So literally they're saying, I wish we could have just died in Egypt where we were at least had our bellies full rather than coming out here and dying from hunger. But guys, that's insane. They were slaves in Egypt. And now they're free. God has brought them out, the great exodus. But that's what they tell him. They want to go back for the free food. The sense of that passage in Exodus 16 is not just that they were hungry. Okay, we all know that we get physically hungry. The sense in that passage was that they were craving something. An unhealthy spiritual craving of something that was outside their reach. Why bring that up? Because this is addictive behavior. It's illogical. I want to go back to Egypt where I was a slave just so I can have free food that's better than this food I'm getting in the desert. It's complete nonsense. 
But that's addictive behavior, okay? That's how addictions work. It doesn't make sense. Alcohol addiction is killing my life. I, may, I feel really, 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 really down. What should I get to help me with that? Oh, how about alcohol? That's how it works. Okay, it, it makes no sense. So why do I bring all that up? It's because the addictive nature of what the Israelites were feeling and saying in Exodus 16 is not just for addicts in our modern sense of the word, okay? Addicts in the biblical sense, which is all of us, feel this with our sin. Here's what I mean. Sin, by its very nature, is addictive, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Why do normal addictions happen? Our culture chalks it up purely to genetics or upbringing, any number of things to explain it. And don't get me wrong, those things can be huge contributing factors. I hate to even think that some of you have had abuse and, and chemical problems in your brain or whatever it is that's contributing to the suffering and sin in your life. I know that happens. But does it really sit well with us when addictions get explained away purely by those things? The world says, yeah, it's really bad that he's a raging alcoholic and his alcoholism leads to physical abuse of his wife and children. But it's probably because he was just raised in a really bad situation and has a genetic disposition. Yeah, he constantly has affairs and has ruined his marriage because of what he started looking at online. But he has PTSD from a war and it's just what his dad did to his family. Guys, I'm not downplaying those contributing factors. I haven't experienced much of that. Those are horrible, horrible things. But does it really explain all of it? Does that really satisfy us? So even if you have not been in a commonly accepted addiction, like we would call it today, like alcohol or sexual pleasure or whatever it is, your sin's nature is addictive, okay? It's crouching at the door. It keeps pulling you back in. Why can't you stop worrying? Why can't you shake your depression off? Why can't you stop trying to control everything in your life? And again, I'm not saying these things never require medicine or some other kind of treatment or help. We can debate that. I'm actually very open to that. I'm saying, but even if we grant those things, what I'm saying is that these things also need Jesus, okay? They may be more than a manifestation of sin, but they're not less. Even these lesser sins are dark. We may not think of them like that, but just think about it. anything that pulls you back in further and further into slavery. That's dark. That's darkness. And slavery, as you know, is a common synonym for addiction. Sin isn't just this thing we struggle with every once in a while. It's constant and dark. Whew. All right. So much bad news. <laughs> if you're visiting or you're watching online and you're like, why in the world do people even talk like this anymore? I'm really glad you asked. That's a re really valid question. Um, we do not come here to just feel bad about all this stuff, right? So stay with me. This is the good part. We've seen that sin and its effects are constant in this life. We've seen that it's so dark. But our third and fourth points are much more happy. Our third point, God's redemption is brighter than every darkness. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to tie it together. The chapter starts off like we've seen with Eve thinking that Cain was going to be the heir, right, that to provide the offspring to conquer the serpent, okay? But almost instantly, that idea is gone. Cain kills Abel, and Cain's line does not call on the name of the Lord. There are no offspring from Cain's line that we can envision at all fulfilling this righteous promise. But the righteous brother Cain, I mean Abel, sorry, the righteous brother Abel is dead. So who is it? And so at the beginning of the chapter, we see that play out. And then at the very end of the chapter, in the last two verses, we see that Eve gets pregnant a third time. And it says, and she called his name Seth. And this time, notice, uh, she doesn't just say that God helped her, like she said in the first couple of verses. She says that God appointed another offspring in place of who? In place of Cain, the one she thought was going to be the promised offspring. No, look at it. It says, in the place of Abel, in the place of the righteous brother who was slain. And notice that when Seth and Enosh are mentioned, it's the first time that people began to call on the name of the Lord. 
So guys, whether she knew it or not, I'm convinced that Eve was prophesying here. And I think Moses, the narrator, wants us to see that. So what's significant about Seth? In the last verse, we see that Seth's son, Enosh, is only two layers deep from the, from the family tree of Adam and Eve. Okay, it's not six layers down like Cain going to Lamech. I think that was just to illustrate the sin of Lamech. They wanted to make it all the way there to say, like, this is not a good line. This one's not going to do it. But if this was an, originally an oral story, Seth's line is described just long enough to see that more are coming. And where does Seth's bloodline lead? Some of you know this. In Luke 3, Jesus' genealogy starts off with what? The son of Joseph. I'm not going to butcher these names. The son of Heli, Heli, the son of Mathet, etc. It goes on and on and on. But where does it end? (laughs) Jesus' genealogy in Luke 3. It ends with this. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the Son of God. So Seth's line is mentioned here in Genesis 4, right before there's like a longer genealogy, just in chapter 5. They pulled it forward into chapter 4 because thousands of years before Jesus was born, God was writing to us that Seth's line goes straight to our Savior, who's going to crush the serpent's head. Isn't that awesome? All right, it gets better. How does Jesus crush the serpent's head? We're seeing that God's redemption is brighter than every darkness. Uh, Just four chapters into the Bible, humanity has betrayed God and murdered his brother. But let's review. Jesus was in chapter 1, right, when God spoke the world into being. We know that from John 1, 1. And when God said he would make man in our image, there's Jesus again. He's there in chapter 2 because we see the first marriage, but Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that marriage is actually about Jesus. In the church. He's in chapter 3 because it says God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he's here in chapter 4 because Jesus is the only explanation for this brief mention of Seth and Enosh right before they're about to be mentioned again in chapter 5. When we see Seth here at the end of chapter 4, it's like a beam of light shining back from the cross into the past to Cain and Abel. But we can look down that same beam of light and see redemption and glory, right? And sin no more when we're in paradise. We're almost done, but there's actually still more. Sin is constant and dark, but God's redemption is brighter. And our fourth main point, God's redemption is final. We know this, but how do we see it here? To start with, we've said many times, the promise of the offspring of the woman crushing the offspring of the serpent's head. So that, that image, guys, is final. That's a final victory, okay? It's decisive. So what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished, right? That was the crushing of the serpent's head. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that by dying on the cross, I'm going to paraphrase it, Jesus destroyed death and the one who had the power of death, which is the devil, the serpent. He had the power of death, Satan, had the power of death because unsaved sinners can only fear death which drives us into slavery, into addictive sin. So we see it in the offspring promise in chapter 3. God's redemption is final. And the story of Cain and Abel comes right after that promise for a very specific reason, okay? Most of the chapter is recounting sin, which which is the serpent striking the woman's heel, okay? It's a metaphor being drawn out. And this trajectory ultimately culminates in the sinful murder of Jesus. And as we've seen, the mention of Seth links this passage to the final victory, I really think it's awesome how the book of Hebrews has so many uh, places where it references the Old Testament. And actually, really the entire book of Hebrews is just showing us how the Old Testament points to Jesus. And since that's the case, and since there's so many passages that already, we've already seen relate to this passage in chapter 4, I think it's pretty fair to go back and get one more passage. This one references Cain and Abel specifically. And I think most of you know where I'm going, <laughs> but it's still so awesome. I'm going to read it. Hebrews 12, 23. Uh, 22 through 23, that one is on the slide, says this. Speaking to believers, Hebrews 12, 22 through 23 says this. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, 
and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And here it is. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So I love this. First of all, if we're going to personify sin, let's personify Jesus' blood too, speaking to us. So real quick, who is Jesus' blood speaking to? And then what is it speaking? This is our last point. That God's redemption is final. Romans 8.34 says this, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Okay? He's interceding for us, which means he's continually praying to God for us. He's praying to God. That's the only person we pray to, right? And Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. So Jesus' blood is speaking to God the Father on our behalf, and we get to listen in. But what is Jesus' blood speaking to the Father on our behalf? To answer that, I want to ask, what was Abel's blood crying out to God from the ground? It's not explicitly stated, but if you read Genesis 4, the context, it makes it so clear. Abel's blood was crying out to God effectively something like this. I have been unjustly killed. I am innocent. But Hebrews' blood says, Hebrews says Jesus' blood speaks a better word to God. So, guys, if Abel's blood cries out to God, I am innocent, what does Jesus' blood cry out to God? It cries out, you are innocent if you are in his family. That's some of the best news we could ever hear. And why is it final? Because Jesus is interceding for us. So for all eternity... His blood will never stop calling out for you to the Father. If you're God's child, He's not angry with you and just barely being held back by the blood of Jesus. That's not what we mean by intercession forever. God the Father loves that Jesus died for you. We know this because it was the Father's plan to do it. And we know this because when God raised Jesus from the dead... Were all his wounds taken away? No, the places where the blood poured out, the holes in his hands and feet are still there. So we get to remember forever that God accepts the the blood of Jesus, crying out a better word, that we are innocent. And nothing is more final than forever, right? So now someone says, well, what do we do with this? Where's the application? (laughs) And Hopefully this isn't too disappointing, but the application today is the best application there ever is. First, believe it. Trust it. Second, rejoice. (laughs) Literally, fill your heart up with these things, church, until your soul is uplifted and happy and peaceful. So we started out by saying we tend to minimize our sin. I know I hammered that because I think the chapter hammers it. But what I'm trying to say is We don't comfort ourselves with sin that we committed by minimizing it. We comfort ourselves by looking at it, crouching at our door, and realizing that it's dead. (laughs) It's big, it's dangerous, it's still out to get us, but it's, it's dead, it has no power. That's our great comfort today. Because Jesus' blood cries out, you are innocent, church. Let's pray.